Hello. We're going to be in Genesis 33, 18 through chapter 35, 29 today. In 33, 18 really begins the context that affects the next two chapters. Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. You know, the word safely is really the word shalom. Matter of fact, in the Septuagint, it says Salem, a city of the Shechemites, which implies the word safely there is translated as Salem, which is, of course, the root for shalom. In the American Standard Version, it says Jacob came in peace to the city of Shechem. Now, we wonder about this shalom and Shechem and peace and safety. S.R. Driver has found a city four miles east of Shechem called Salem, S-A-L-I-M. And that may be the confusion, the text, between shalom and a, and a city. It's like he didn't go all the way in the city, but was camped outside the city, and that seems to fit the context. Which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Paddan Aran, and camped before the city. He seems to have stopped short of Bethel, where he should have gone. It's going to cause him some real miseries with his family. And he bought a piece of land where he had pinched his tent from the... Uh, from the hand of the sons of Hamar. Now, Hamar means a donkey or ass. We learn from the Maori tablets that donkeys were uh, sacred animals. Matter of fact, from the Old Testament itself, we learn that the kings of Israel rode on special donkeys. So donkeys in, in the ancient world were considered to be noble, uh, almost sometimes sacred animals we see from the Maori text. So here's a man whose name is Donkey. Uh, Shechem's father for 100 pieces of money. Now, you might want to look at your translation, for we have no idea what this weight of money is. It's only used a, a couple of times. Uh, we just don't know what it is. We find it in Joshua 24, 32. We find it in Job 42, 11. But we, we're not certain what it is. It's only used these first few times in the older parts of the Old Testament. Then he erected an altar and called it El Elah Israel, which means El, God, the God of Israel. Now, this is, a, I think, a tremendous understanding of he's back in the land that God, where God had spoke to him. You might well see chapter 28, verse 21. But he didn't go all the way back to Bethel where he should have gone. He kind of stopped short. Now, Diana, the daughter of Leah, it's the only daughter apparently Jacob had. Others aren't listed. Imagine what one daughter and all these brothers. You think she was spoiled rotten? Well, I bet she was. Apparently, she is a pretty girl. Her name is like Dan, except it's feminine. So she, her, it's judges, okay? And, she, and uh, she went out to visit the daughters of the land. Who? Well, the people of the city of Shechem. And when Shechem, the son of Hamar, now the city of Shechem and the son are the same name, okay? The Hivite. Now, the Septuagint has Horite. You might want to see Genesis 34, 2 and Joshua 9, 7. It seems when you look at these two names, Horites and Hivites, that they're obviously a non-Semitic group. Because in the context, they're not going to be circumcised. Everybody we know in the Canaan was circumcised except the Philistines, who are probably the uh, mercenaries from the islands of the Aegean that evaded Palestine about 1250 B.C. They weren't circumcised. But apparently these uh, Hivites or Horites weren't either. Many people assume that they are probably Hurrians, H-U-R-R-A-I-N-S. And we see them reflected uh, in some of the uh, Nuzi tablets, their culture. The prince of the land saw her and took her and lay with her by force. Now, obviously, uh, he rapes the girl. But he was deeply attracted to Diana, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. He fell in love with her even after abusing her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamar, saying, Get this young girl for, uh, as a wife for me. Now, this shows that parents usually arrange the marriages. Um, I think that sounds funny to us in our culture, but it seems to be exactly what the Old Testament was doing in many cultures today. That's still uh, true. Now, Jacob heard that he had defiled Diana, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob kept silent until they came in. This means that Jacob kind of thought he couldn't do anything because he wasn't strong enough. It implies he's going to, but he couldn't right then. Then Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak to him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field. When they heard it, the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done uh, a disgraceful thing in Israel. Now this shows that this was inappropriate, not only in Israel, uh, but we learn from other cultures it's inappropriate. This shows that there were some sexual guidelines quite early. 
Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis 20, Genesis 26, and Genesis 39, 9, it shows that, they, that there's some morality even in these Canaanite peoples where a man's wife was sacred and given to him and violations of her was inappropriate and violations of a young woman, unmarried, was inappropriate. They have better morality than we do. Um, notice the last part of verse 7. For such a thing ought not to be done. And I think you see the same idea there. But Hamar spoke to them saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. And intermarry with us and give us your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourself. Now back in chapter Genesis 24-3, Abraham had been pro, uh, prohibited and prohibited his servant to get a uh, marriage partner for Isaac from the Canaanites. You say, well, Bob, these aren't Canaanites. They're apparently non-Semitic people. Yes, but they had moved into Canaan and they had taken up the characteristics of the Canaanites as God help us, the Israelites will also do. Thus you shall live with us and the land shall be open before you to live in and trade in and acquire property in it. This same idiom is used back in Genesis 13.9 and Genesis 20.15 to mean live together. And Shechem also said to his father and to his brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Uh, ask me uh, ever so much in bridal payment and gift. Now this is the idea of a diary. In Hebrew, it's the idea of M-O-H-A-R, a mohar. And you can see examples of it in Exodus 22.16, 1 Samuel 18.25. It was usually saved for the wife in case the husband died, she had something. It was usually given to her years later. You might want well to see Genesis 31:15, where Laban's daughters are mad at him because apparently he spent uh, the, the seven years that Jacob labored for them. Her, their father didn't keep any of the money for them. It's not a purchase price. Remember that. It's a different culture, but it is the right to marry the girl. It's a way of... A, a, of giving the family some kind of monetary remuneration for the loss of the, of the labor of that particular member of the family. Now what were they going to ask for? Well the son said, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. Now circumcision was a sign of the covenant with Yahweh. But here they're not so much concerned with the spiritual aspect of the covenant, i.e. knowledge of Yahweh, as they are the physical aspect. And that's something that men have always gotten hung up with. And that is, we often somehow lose the thrust of the symbol, get caught up in the ritual instead of in the spiritual aspect behind the ritual. And that's what's going to happen here, although from the context, maybe they had this evil motive in mind all along. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. Now their words seemed reasonable to Hamar and Shechem, Hamar's son. And the young men did not delay to do the thing because, and there's two reasons, he was delighted with Jacob's daughter, and number two, he was more respected than all the household of his father. Well, that shows that this Shechem, though he acted rather uh, passionately, was apparently a very respected man, and the people respected him, and they would follow his leadership. And I want to tell you, being circumcised as, as an adult took some leadership. <laughs> so Hamar and his son Shechem came to the gate of the city, place of justice, place of decision, place where the older men would gather and talk and spoke to the men of the city, saying, These men are friendly. Here's the use of the word shalom again with us. Now, they don't use the idea about, we, I want to marry Diana. Look at verse 23. What they use is the prophet motive, saying, Look, they'll intermarry with us, and we'll get some of their cattle as inheritance by giving our daughters and taking our sons and all of that. So they, they appeal to the prophet motive, and the men of the city go for it. Now, it came about the third day when they were in pain. I, I don't don't know I was circumcised as a baby but I hear that from adults that it's very very painful and three days is probably the most painful to move around so when these men could not move two of Jacob's sons Simeon and Levi both the brothers of Diana the second and third son are going to come into the city with their swords and they're going to kill uh, every everybody women, uh, men women children everybody take the cattle take the plunder now, we learned that from, from uh, Exodus 49, 5 through 7, that this is why Levi is dispersed among the tribes and can't have a land inheritance. Now, later on, it's because they take the place of the firstborn, Exodus 13, and they become priests unto God in place of the firstborn. But in Ex Exodus, I mean, excuse me, Genesis 49, 5 through 7, it's because Levi did this thing. Now, Simeon is dispersed among Judah and becomes incorporated in Judah very early and loses its entire tribal designation. So these two boys are judged. 
And they killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword. They took Diana from Shechem's house and went forth. Notice Diana hadn't been asked what she wants in this deal at all. So Jacob's son came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. And they took their flocks, their herds, their donkeys, and that which was in the city and that which was in the, in the field. They took all their property, but they killed all the people, except for the women and the children, which they kept for themselves, and they just took them into their homes. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, now Jacob's really going to be mad at them, and this is one reason why they're bypassed in, in the inheritance rights. Uh, Reuben's going to be bypassed later because he took one of his father's concubines. And so in Genesis 49, it mentions that about Reuben, who is the firstborn. But here Jacob says, what have you done? The Canaanites are going to see this and be mad and going to attack us. It almost seems like Jacob's more concerned about that they might have brought uh, evil on him than they are. They've done a very inappropriate act. Now, I agree Shechem started it. But here's a good example. You don't fight fire with fire. You don't pay evil for evil because it really causes problems. Um, let's see. But, but they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? And Jacob apparently was appeased by that and as far as reacting. Now, chapter 35. Uh, then God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel. That's where he should have gone in the first place and he'd, he'd have missed all this misery. And live there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled. This sounds funny. Make an altar to the God who appeared to you. Why not just say make a God, a, an altar to me? Well, I don't know, but it's, it's the idea here of the word Elohim, and it's, it's just put in a funny way, but I, I think it's referring to that. You might well see verse 28. So Jacob said to his household and to all who are with him, now who that involved? Servants, slaves, other shepherds, his children, their wives, that kind of thing. Put away foreign gods. Now the word gods here is exactly the word Elohim that's translated with a capital G in verse 1. Put away these alien or foreign gods which are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Now, did they have foreign gods with them? Yeah, go back to Genesis 31, 19 and 30. They had these teraphim, these little idols they stole from Laban. At least Rachel did. Now, I think Jacob here is saying we need to get spiritually ready to go and meet God and, and, and sacrifice there and live there. Now, this concept of getting spiritually ready or purifying yourself is going to be caught up later in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. Also, again, this uh, purifying yourself and change your garments, the changing of garments was an outward sign, along with the washing of the body, of an inward change. And so often in the history of men, they've, they've turned the outward change of garments or the outward washing of the body into the spiritual reality. The reality is of the heart, and the clothes and the body washing are just an outward expression of an inner thing. We need to hear that. And let us arise and go to Bethel, house of God, like Bethlehem is house of bread, and Bethsaida is house of fish. And I will make an altar there to God. Elohim, same word, capitalized with a G here, singular, as is little g, plural, in the previous verse. It just depends on the context how you translate Elohim. Who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. He recognizes that uh, God has been with him. And he senses he needs to be clean. You know, in Leviticus, uh, sometimes things are cleansed by fire. Sometimes they're cleansed by water. Sometimes they're cl cleansed by the shedding of blood. Here, they're going to be cleansed by simply putting away the foreign gods and getting their hearts ready. I think that's important. Uh, we see that. Now, um, so, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which they had and the rings which were in their ears. Now, some say this is a sign, a, 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 some kind of fetish, magical thing. Others say, no, it's an emblem or mark of, of the gods. You might well see Genesis 12, 6. Um, I'm not sure I know. Some say, see Hosea 2, 13, where earrings may have been a symbol of a deity. But they, were, they took their earrings off too, which were either was a, too elaborate or had some connection with these gods. And Jacob hid them under the oak. Now, the word oak comes from the Septuagint. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's the word tenebeth which is near Shechem. Now, these oaks were usually very sacred sites. You might want to see Joshua 24, 26, Judges 9, verse 6, and Judges 9, 37. I don't think uh, that they were especially holy for Hebrews, except for the fact they showed an underground water source, and usually that was a place of prosperity, and they just came to be very holy sites. As they journeyed there, it was a great terror upon the cities which were around them. Now, this was God's promise to protect Jacob. Back in the end of chapter 34, Jacob was afraid that, that the Canaanites would come upon him. 
God promised they wouldn't, and here's showing that God was true to his word. Um, so Jacob came to Luz. Now Luz is the name of this city, Bethel, that the Canaanites called it. You might well see chapter 28, verse 19. The Jews always called it Bethel, but the Canaanites Luz, uh, which is in the land of Cana, he and all his people who are with him. And he built an altar there. Now, usually they built an altar after God appeared to him, but God had already appeared to him here, and so he built an altar, apparently for sacrifice, and called the place El Bethel, or the God of Bethel. Now, here again, we've got to be careful uh, that we don't m mix up the altar and God. People are so bad about putting uh, holy things on objects instead of remembering that sometimes objects just represent God. <clears throat> because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now Deborah, Rachel's nurse, died. She'd been a very faithful person. She goes back, clear back to Genesis 24, 50, 59, came with uh, Rebecca when she came to meet Isaac, so was a very uh, faithful servant all these years. And she was buried below Bethel under the oak, again under a tree, a sacred spot. And its name was the Oak of Weeping. Now, this oak of weeping has the same root in Hebrew as the uh, bochim, or place of weeping, weeping in Judges 2.5, same Hebrew root. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Paddan Aram, and he blessed him. It's very much like Genesis 28, almost exactly repeat. It goes back to the covenant promises of Abraham that are here given to Jacob. And Elohim said to him, Your name is Jacob, which meant surplanter or grabber but you shall no longer be called Jacob. Now you might want well to see Genesis 32, 28, and 29, where Jacob wrestles with the angel and his name is changed. But Israel, now exactly what the etymology of the word Israel, I don't know. Uh, some say it's a wrestle with God or grappled with God or blessing. We're just not real certain. Shall be your name. Thus you shall call him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. This is the word El Shaddai. Now, Shaddai comes from a root that means many-breasted, and so it means God the all-sufficient one. From Numbers, excuse me, Exodus 6, 2, we learn that the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, call God El Shaddai. Now, the term Yahweh appears in the early part of Genesis, and they may have used the word Yahweh, but they never knew what it meant until God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, Exodus 3, uh, 14. Okay, this many-breasted idea for Shaddai can be seen very clearly in uh, Genesis 49, 25, and you might want to, to look at that. This, this title is used uh, very characteristically of God providing for the patriarchs. It's usually associated with blessing. You might want to see Genesis 17, 1, Genesis 28, 3, Genesis 35, 11, and Genesis 48, 3, and 4. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, now, the Jews say this is one of the, the reasons that Jacob took all these women was to fulfill this. Baloney. I think Jacob just had too many hormones. And the king shall come forth from you. And the land which I give to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you. And I will give the land to your descendants after you, just like he promised to Abraham in 12, 15, 17, and 22. Then God came up to him, uh, to the place where he had spoken to him. Then God went up from him. What does that mean? It's a spatial idea. Does that mean that God kind of rose up from where he, he met him? Well, you know, in the ancient, they thought of God as being up. That's why the smoke from the sacrifice went up to God as a soothing aroma. I don't think because we've sent Sputniks out there and, and, and gone to, to the moon and beyond that we can say, well, God's not out there. The spatial idea is not the aspect, but the transcendence of God, which separates himself some, and the eminence of God, which comes and speaks, is the theological categories here, not uh, this terminology being uh, scientific. It's descriptive, not scientific. And Jacob set up a pillar, just like he had earlier, Genesis 28, 18, 19, and 21. Also, you see the same thing in Genesis 35, 20, over Rachel's grave. Now, later, this is going to be condemned, because it, this came to be a sign of the fertility god Baal. But here, it's simply an act of worship, and he's going to anoint this stone to simply say, God met me here, and this place is special. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and uh, where there was uh, still some distance to go, to Ephrath. Now, Ephrath, uh, or Ephrath is another name for Bethlehem. That's why in Micah 5, 2, it says Bethlehem Ephrath, uh, because there's another Bethlehem. I believe it's up by the Sea of Galilee and another tribal allocation up there. So this is, simply means Bethlehem is the area. 
And Rachel began to give birth, and she suffered severe labor. She had some uh, problems in, in childbirth. And it came about that she was in severe labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for now you have another son. Very important to the Jews. And it came about as her soul departed. This is very important. It's the word nephesh. Too often we have been influenced in the church by the Greek idea of the word soul. Uh, in the Greek concept, every man has a soul. And it's kind of an impersonal thing from an impersonal deity. And the great desire is to get our, that spark of the divine back to the ocean of the divine. That, that's Greek. And uh, when we talk about we have a soul, that we're speaking in Greek terms. Uh, basically, Hebrew says we are a soul. Remember in Genesis 2, it said God formed man out of the, the red clods, the Adamah, and breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living nephesh. Now, the animals are also called nephesh, so it seems to mean animated animal life. Now, the breath of God is unique in man, but animals also have nephesh, and so it's connected with the word breathing. Matter of fact, the word nephesh, when it comes from Akkadian, seems to come from the word throat, a breathing in the throat. You might want to see for some other places where the nephesh is used for animals, be Genesis 1.21, Genesis 1.24, Genesis 2.19, Leviticus 11:46, Genesis 24:18. So uh, you might want well to see Psalm 69:2 for the idea of the nephesh being the throat, a place of breathing. So she breathed her last; her breath came out. The breath was from God, and therefore she died. Um, and she named him Ben Ani, which meant the son of my sorrow. But Jacob changed the name to Benjamin which means the son of my right hand. Now, the right hand being the place of honor, the, the place of skill, the place of help. Um, and I think that's really important. Now, some say that uh, from the Mari tablets, uh, the son of the right hand was meant the son of the south because these people usually faced east and south was always the right hand that way. I don't know what that means, except I thought it was interesting. It's free to those who give the cooperative program. And Jacob set up a pillar over her grave, and that is the pillar of Rachel to this day. Now, to this day shows an editorial comment. Does that mean Moses made that or someone later? Well, I think it's obvious that the Pentateuch has been gone over by an editor. The Jews say it's Ezra. Uh, it could, could have possibly been Joshua. I, I don't know. Could be Moses here. And Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the tower of, of Eder. And it came about while Israel was uh, dwelling in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard of it. Jacob heard of it. Now, the judgment for this act is found in uh, Genesis 49, 3 and 4. Reuben's the firstborn son. He should have been the heir of promise. But he is disqualified for his uh, going into his father's concubine. Now, why did he do that? Is he just uh, oversexed? Well, it's probably inheritance rights. He probably did it to ensure he would have the inheritance rights. Because to take a, someone's concubine was a symbol that you had their property. But his father's still alive. So he is rejected. Uh, Simeon and Levi are rejected because of what they did to Shechem, the city of Shechem. So now we're down to Judah as the oldest son who hadn't been disqualified for some reason. Now these are the twelve sons of Jacob. And it lists here by the two primary wives, Leah and Rachel, and their slaves, uh, uh, Bilhah and Zilpah. Now, reason is so important from the Newsy tablets, which describe the Hurrian culture, which is the non-Semitic um, people who live in, in, in this area. We learned that, that usually when a, a man married a girl, he got, the girl was given a slave or a maid. And just in case the girl could not bear children, that was so important to these ancients, they somehow lived on their children, that, that, that the slave girl could be used as a way to raise up an heir for the barren wife. And this exactly fits. That's why I think every time archaeology has made a discovery in the ancient Near East, the historicity of the Bible has been confirmed. In all of the archaeological discoveries, the Bible's history has been confirmed, except possibly uh, Jericho. The site of Jericho has been so badly damaged by erosion, you, you, we can't confirm or deny the history of the Bible based on the archaeological finds of Jericho. And here they're all listed, 12 of them. You can notice a map how the land's going to be divided later on. Now, and Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre. Now, Mamre is another place about oaks, uh, uh, sacred uh, trees. You might want to see a Mamre 
You see, it'd be uh, Genesis 18.1 and Genesis 23.19. What does it mean Jacob came to his father, Isaac? Um, well, let's see. It's going to... Jacob came to his father, Isaac, at Mamre, which is at Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had journeyed. So he came home. Notice, remember, Isaac thought he was going to die uh, 20 years earlier than this. The man's still alive. So just goes to show, just because you feel bad, that means it's, it's your time. <laughs> Um, let's see. Some of the other sites of this oak, that are, it's mentioned by Josephus um, and also by Eusebius. And the book of Jubilees also mentions these sacred sites, and you might want to look that up. Now, the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last and died. He was gathered to his people, an old man of ripe age, and his son Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, earlier, remember uh, that uh, Isaac and Ishmael had buried their father, and here's the same kind of pattern. Esau and, Isaac and Jacob got back together to marry their dad. What does it mean he was gathered to his people? He wasn't buried in exactly the same place. Well, this is the concept of Sheol, that somehow families were together in the afterlife. In these early parts of the Bible, the afterlife was not really clarified yet. They believed in a conscious existence, but it was a shadowy existence, a pale, no joy. But as later revelation, we call it progressive revelation, occurred, more and more insight began to be given. Until in the book of Job and in some of the Psalms, in the book of Daniel chapter 12, we see there is going to be a meaningful life after death. And of course, this is built in the New Testament. Well, I've enjoyed being with you. I hope you've enjoyed this study of the Old Testament. Uh, some of these things here, Bob, how does this apply to me? Well, sometimes it's just history. And sometimes it records things it doesn't mean to advocate. But many times there are spiritual principles involved here that apply in our life. May God give you the wisdom to know the spiritual principles that are true and to be able to filter out the shaft that is simply cultural or historical. Have a good day. God bless you.